so many times I noted that there's a lot of preaching and a lot of teaching okay, as a local assembly but I think that a time needs to come where we actually do more than just preaching or teaching where we have conversations because that is how families talk right? Yeah. when families meet what do they do? they have conversations it would be very weird for a father to start to call the children and say, and say, say who is the papa says? Ha ha! You know what the papa says? Ha ha! A, you'll be wondering, the children will be wondering, the one will whisper to the other and say, are you, are you thinking what I'm thinking? So if we don't act weird when we are having, when we are with our family, we need to recognize that God is father and he wants to have conversation with his children. Right? And that's important for us to know, okay, that it's okay and it's normal. It's actually the right thing to do. So let's have a conversation this morning around kingdom economy. Why is it important that we have a conversation around kingdom economy? It's because there's a culture that um, this family of God, and when I talk about the family of God, I'm talking about that the kingdom of God has, the church has, and that culture has been eroded or quickly been eroded. And that has created problem. So this meeting is with, with the help of the Holy Spirit to solve a lot of the problems that we are having in the family. Right? Because we must ensure that our family is healthy. Every family must be healthy. And that should include the family of God's church. Right? So we're not strangers to the blessing of what the Bible calls the commonwealth of Israel. It's also something that the Bible calls the commonwealth. Now, growing up, we all knew what we had at the commonwealth of the British commonwealth, yes? And the British commonwealth basically spoke to uh, countries that were colonized by the British government. And the British government had processes to make sure that every country within the commonwealth had some basic things that they didn't have to think about or struggle about. One of it is, was that they were absolutely well resourced. It looked bad on the Queen of England, now King Charles, but on the Queen of England, it looked bad on her if any of the colonies or the former colonies struggled. Whether it was India or Nigeria or Ghana, I think I know, at least I know British West Africa. Okay. So each of those countries were well catered to. Interestingly, when you study the business model, let me use the word, the business model of the British Commonwealth, and you compare it with the business model of the French colonies or the French colonial masters, you will see a big difference. Because wealth must be common. Wealth must be common. So there were two ethos of the British Commonwealth that made the Commonwealth very, very strategic and very helpful. Number one, there are many of them, but number one, there was mutual respect and equality among all member states, regardless of the size or the economic status. All of them were equal partners. It was established, it was clear, that it wouldn't matter whether India had two billion people or Nigeria had Nigeria has 200 million people. Every one of the sovereign states was seen as sovereign and equal. And systems were put in place for them to be able to resource and connect with one another. And uh, it's likely, it's actually the closest that you can have in the human system that I've seen that expresses how wealth is distributed in the kingdom of God. Another thing that they had among other things, was the collaboration or cooperation among members, member nations. They made sure that they worked together to address common challenges and foster economic growth. So every single member of the British Commonwealth, which has now been called the Commonwealth of Nations, change the name, had those two things, collaboration and cooperation, and mutual respect. Right? 
So why is this important to us? It's important to us because we're dealing with the issue of economy. Now, I spoke about a culture that has been eroded from the economy or from the kingdom of God. And, when I, and I'm going to be using church interchangeably with kingdom. Church with kingdom. Because when you mention church, you're actually talking about that system that God established through his son Jesus, right? The church is a kingdom. It is designed to express the, the kingdom, how the kingdom of God should look like. Now, forget about all the things that we do that we have tried to factor into it that makes it, that make it carnal and, 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 and um, all the things. But the church is actually God's plan to show the world what kingdom looks like. So, bottom line is that we're going to have this conversation around how do we, using, let me use the word of Paul, Apostle Paul, how do we equalize the kingdom community? Right? Praise the Lord. <laughs> and I think that the world came to a point of problem when they were trying to structure the educational system of the world, at least I know in Nigeria, that made them decide that they were going to have schools. Schools started, uh, they they introduced uniforms. You know why they introduced uniforms? Do you know why? Because parents will keep their children in designer wears to make the other child look bad. You parents, I'm talking about you parents. So that you can know they will, they will, they will take in this church, in this school. So parents will, they will buff up their children. So that when the children comes into class, their children are whether have complex. So schools decided that this badness has to stop. Let us all give all of them blue and white. And even at that, many of you will make sure your blue and white is from England. And you say, we, our own blue and white, we bought it from England. And it's not from Primark. It's from Max and Spencer. You, you, have to, you have to put the label somewhere. Shame on all of you. Shame. What I'm trying to say is that there's always something toxic about humans. So always try to pretend or to assert and to show that I better pass my neighbor. And that's toxic. Anybody here with me? So when we're dealing with economy, kingdom economy, I want, to, I want to get you to have a clear perspective on that. What is economy? First of all, economy is from two words, oiko and nomos. And there, there is economy of nations, there is, economy, there is family economy, there is um, economy of companies and corporates. But the basic thing, the thing basically about economy, any economy, whichever you look at about it, is about distribution of resources. So when we say economy, from the Latin word oikonomos, what we're saying is household and management. Household and management. So it's about how household manage resources. Right? And that determines how healthy how productive, how progressive, and how happy that our soul is. And that is why it's important for us to talk about it. I'm going to be looking a lot about the culture of gleaning. And I, I think I got very inspired to speak about this when, after last week, my wife spoke and said, well, Pastor, maybe one of these days you need to talk to us about the culture, about, about gleaning. It's important for us to understand what is the pain points and to deal with it. The thing about the kingdom of God is, Ministry should be solving a problem, not create more. Sadly, we are creating more problems. We are using the ministry and the anointing of Jesus to create more problems for the world. But that's going to stop in this church. Amen. Amen. Why? Because we are going to have good economy. Amen. When I say good economy, good economy, what I mean by we are going to have distribution of management of resources within the society. The thing about resources, our economy, is that economy is a culture. It's called, economy is not even about money or wealth. It's a, it's a culture. And that is what I want us to discuss. And I, I think, I, again, I borrowed a leaf from Pastor Fumi. She was speaking at the family today on, on Friday. And then she was describing what wealth is. And she, she said, wealth is in more than just money, but much more expressed through health, through relationships, and through riches. So when we talk about wealth, or when we talk about commonwealth, it's not just about money. And money is important in that, right? But whenever we hear wealth, the first thing, the only thing that comes to our head is money. But as a matter of fact, if you do not have the other factors in wealth, you are not creating wealth, you're creating problem. 
So let's deal with one of the aspects of wealth creation or wealth development which has to do with relationships apart from health, right? They say health is wealth. So if you're healthy, right, then your money in the bank makes sense, right? If you're not healthy, right, the money in the bank doesn't make sense. If you don't have healthy relationship with your children, the money you have in the bank doesn't make sense, right? If you're not rich towards other people, it's a matter of time because before you become food to the area boys, right? That's why the people who are not rich towards society are very afraid to travel or to go out in the day because they're going to mug you. That's why we are encouraging government and systems. If you know what is good for you, stop stealing from the public phone because when the hungry has no more food, guess what they're going to eat? The rich. All right, so that should let you know one thing, first of all, that the best solution for insecurity is making sure that there is common wealth. And governments need to understand this. And that actually is the reason why Jesus built his church the way he built it. So let's take a bit of deep dive into the concept of economy. Now, the world has a different concept of economy. The economy of the world, as we know it, is built on the factors of demand and supply, right? What we call market forces, right? If there is high demand, something happens. If there is low demand, something is costed. If supply is much, prices reduce, right? If demand is high, and people jack up the price, and it never comes down. You get it? And those are the factors that determine economies of the world. But in the real sense of true economy, or true riches, or true wealth, is different. Something else controls it. And that is really why we are here today. Now, the economy of the world system because it's pulled or inspired or rise on the back of demand and supply, there is a spirit that God said. There is a spirit that sits on top of it as Lord and Master, and that spirit is called Mammon. Now, one of the ways you know what spirit is guarding a culture or an economy is are some of the things that are the outputs, and I'll talk about some of them today. So mammon is an evil spirit. And Jesus spoke about this, about mammon. He says, he says, you cannot serve two masters. You remember I said that? He said there are, two, there are two kingdoms. There is the kingdom of God, and then there is the kingdom of, of, of mammon. He said, if you want to serve me, this is the process. He said, if you, don't know, if you want to serve mammon, this is the process. Because mammon is a spirit. It's an evil spirit. It's an evil spirit that's, that is associated with the temptations of wealth and worldly success. Um, breaking down economy so that you understand and if you put your mind to it, you begin to see that what we actually call most time, for the most part econo kingdom economy is actually mammon. What we actually pull ourselves in, even, and I'm talking to you to our shame, even as the church, what we are really, really dealing with or what we are really, the God that we bow to is actually the God of worldly success. A lot of what we are doing, even in ministry, and I, and I can tell you this for free, is we are having, we are building a whole system around you must be successful and we, when, the way we teach success is that somebody has to be better than somebody. Actually, what we're doing, we, what we don't know, we don't know it. What we're actually doing is that we are preaching capitalism in the church. What we're actually doing in the church by our preachings and by a lot of things that we do uh, we are actually telling the saints don't be happy for the other person be better than the other person let your testimony be bigger than the other person's testimony how many people know we always talk about it? so if it is you what happens to him who cares about him Amy? you get it now we don't say we use scripture to say and one of the things that God is going to help me to do today is to share those scriptures we look at it together right so when we talk about kingdom economy economy of the kingdom is about its target is human redemption the redemption of mankind the redemption of the brothers and sisters one of the one of the legends not a legend one of the real scenario that, that spoke to me a great deal was the story of um, Ruth and Boaz 
Ruth had just, the Moabite lady had just relocated from where she was living with her mother, with her mother-in-law. And um, the young lady had to fend for the family because the family was open and broken. You know, back in those days, the men were the breadwinners. This woman had lost the breadwinner, her husband and two, bo and two boys. So and Naomi, she was, she was broken. She had no means of economy. She had no resource. She was poor. She was broke. She, was, she had nothing. So this young lady who came with her said, don't worry, you're also too old to work. I'll go work. So she went to look for work. She, was, she couldn't get any work because nobody was going to apply. Number one, she was a foreigner. Number two, she was a lady. But so she, she stumbled on the field of a man called Boaz. And the scripture says that Boaz saw her and said, what, what young lady is that? And they told him who the lady, young lady was. He said, oh, wow, I know them. You know, and said, don't let her go anywhere else. Let her glean from this. That's where they got the word gleaning from. Gleaning basically means the leftovers. So the harvesters, during their barley harvest, their wheat harvest, their bumper harvest, they will harvest everything so that they can make money and they can, they can say, let's just at our harvest. But God put in place a system that he called the gleaning, which is that you have to deliberately leave something behind for those who are weak and those who are poor. Let me tell you this, this is the basis where we have offering and giving in church. That's where it all started from. God's design, God's intention is that, Jesus said this, says, the poor you will always have with you. Now, I don't care what any preacher is preaching, or any faith preacher is telling you we are all not going to have the millions we are all not going to have house in banana island we are not going to have houses by the lakeside right hey because how you create wealth is by capacity it's not by sowing seed Let me tell you this, because when I say this, when we, we say this, we say, whoa, Pastor Talks is not asking us to be blessed. This is how you get blessed. Listen to this. Right? A, a number of what we teach or what we have been taught or what we are teaching people actually breach the spirit of greed and mammon. And I'll explain to you what I'm talking about and you will see it yourself. Right? Hmm? So, kingdom wealth, kingdom economy is for human redemption. And there's a principle called the the guardian redeemer's principle that is the principle between Boaz and Ruth a guardian redeemer and that what Boaz did for Ruth was actually a code about what Christ is to us that was really Christ what that Boaz did was actually Christ Christ is the guardian redeemer for us and all he did all he deals and talks about things about <clears throat> is our redemption so so that Ruth and Naomi will not starve to death. God connected them with a guardian redeemer who saved their life. Because he gave them instruction. He said, I know you glean a little bit, you leave a little bit, you know, for the poor. So when they are harvesting, they leave a little bit. He said, now be intentional about it. Make sure that you leave a lot for this woman because they are connected to me by covenant and it is my responsibility to make sure that they don't die they don't starve to death so so boaz preserved boaz redeemed ruth and naomi from certain death and when naomi was going to talk about him she said oh you met who did you meet today where did you well, you have this bag because when she came back that day she had a big bag of lead when you are when you are greening you don't get big bags you, get, you, get, you just get small enough to be able to eat for the day. So you have to go there tomorrow. But Naomi came home with a very big bag of, of, of wheat. Ruth, Ruth was surprised. How did you get that? You don't get this on gleaning. No harvester, no man, no farmer who has worked all his life to sow a seed will now leave a bag of wheat. You say waiting. They didn't have a choice but to leave something behind. But not that you will leave a big bag of... Uh, so when Ruth came home with big bag of stuff, Naomi said, who did you get? And she said, I chanced on the farm of a man called Boaz. Naomi said, oh, really? Boaz? You know, that, how did you get it? Boaz is our kinsman redeemer. He's our guardian redeemer. That's the principle of Christ. Now, anybody here? Are you here with me? I'm dealing with kingdom economy. The, 
it is different in this, in this kingdom when we're dealing with the economy of the kingdom. All right? So, kingdom economy, therefore, means that we are called to manage the household of God and to achieve commonwealth for the community. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So now, why is this important for us to continue to talk about this? Why? Because in this season, for those of you who know, I've been talking about this. God has brought us into a season of the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm putting this before your face because it's important for you to understand this quote and this concept because it will help you. It's a season of rejoicing in the blessings of the Lord. Because the, the time of the Feast of Tabernacles is when the farmers come and they harvest their wheat and they harvest their crop and they are carrying and they are rejoicing because they have sown in tears. Now they are carrying their harvest with joy, singing, right? And we are singing, we are rejoicing. It's the day of rejoicing for us as a people. But also in the midst of it, we need to recognize that God demands that we also be like Adonai Yaire. We must see to it that the needs of others are provided for. So guess what happens? So when God gave them instruction, uh, when Nehemiah came out of the exile, that's a lot of story. You, you, you don't worry, you enjoy the story. Praise the name of Jesus. Right? So when, when, when they came out of the captivity of 70 years, Nehemiah was their leader, or the governor, and one of the things that Nehemiah did was that he put in place a celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. So jump with me to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 9 and 10. I'll just read verse 9 and 10. The book of Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 9 and 10. Are you there with me? It says, then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and teacher of the law, and the Levites, were instructing the people and said to them, and I talked about this, about, I think, about a couple of weeks ago, about Ezra taking the people through a whole day of just reading the scriptures. So I'm going to do a bit of that today. I'm just going to take some time to read the scriptures with you, all right? Because it's when we discover, we, one of the reasons why we got into where we are wrongly is because we did not know the scriptures, Right? Right? There's a lot of assumption. There's a lot of um, postulations. There's a lot of human ideas that, that have made its way to church right now and has been accepted as culture. Right? And that's why it's toxic. That's why our churches are not, our saints are not happy. Pastors are not happy. Members are not happy. Everybody's taking advantage of one another. Everybody hates one another. Right? Satan is hardly having a party in churches. Right? Why? Because so, the Bible says in verse eight, 9 and 10, Then they made the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who are instructing the people, said to them, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. Remember we said that. For all the people have been weeping as they listen to the words of the Lord. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. He said, And send some to those who have nothing prepared. So there are always going to be people in your house, in your economy, in your church, in your family, who have nothing prepared. And it's a responsibility to eat choice food and have sweet drinks, but also to have something prepared for those who have nothing. For this day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Let's read a little bit of scripture. March, March 24, March 24, right? Let, let's build this. Let's build this. Matthew 24, verse 45 to 51. Matthew 24, verse 45 to 51. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? This actually is dealing with that word householder is the word oikonomos, where we got economy from. So it's dealing with the house manager. So there are certain things that are expected of a house manager. Let me tell you this, friends. What you call church, what we call church ministry, is house management. Church is economy. What I say? What I'm doing right now, what we're doing right now, is economy. If, if, if I, it, it doesn't even get any better than this. In fact, this is the right, the right template for economy should be the church. And so Jesus is saying something here. He says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? So there is, there must be food, there must be resource, there must be time in distribution of the resource. 
if the resource does not come at the right time some people will starve and that must never be allowed to happen in a kingdom economy so there must be stuff there must be resource right go on with it it will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns truly i tell you it will put him in charge of all his possessions but suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself now that means it's also possible for the econ- for the householder or the or economos or the administrator to be oppressive right right his job description is different what's the job description give resource to the people at specified time but he can decide to do his own thing against the master's instruction and so what he will what will he do he will be wicked and say to himself my master is staying away a long time and then he begins to beat his fellow servants that's not his job description no what's the job description <laughs> feed the people at the right time but this guy became creative and innovative he decides I'm going to beat my fellow servants for whatever reason and he also will decide to eat and drink the drunkards that's a self indulgence so here you have the twin demon of a household manager an economy or economos an administrator who has given the mandate to feed the house resource them at the right time who by himself and by self creativity decides i'm going to be oppressive i'm going to beat the people then i'm going to take the resource that i've been put in my care and hang out with the boys at the bar and drink myself to stupor all those are not in the job description his job is very simple make resources available make sure the economy runs you are the economos so already you can see that a lot of economos have already failed in their responsibilities right the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he's not aware of so there will be judgment now he will cut him to pieces and assign a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and what gnashing of teeth there will be regret well, that's bible language for regrets right so god is going to judge every oppressive or every going out of the job description now when we're dealing with the issue of the culture of gleaning what Boaz did in the Old Testament Paul established in the New Testament and I, re- I think I want to read this extensively in the message Bible because I want it to be very simple so that we just read through it and then we we enjoy it second Corinthians chapter 8 I'm going to read all the way from verse 1 to 24 and then 2 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 1 to 15. It's a good habit that we need to bring back to reading the scriptures. Hey guys. Paul said to Timothy, to Timothy, Timothy, make sure you ensure the habit of public reading of scripture. There is so much interpretation, self-interpretation read into the word of God. So let's read scripture, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want to read from verse 1, like I said, all the way. Now, friends, I want to report on the surprising and generous ways in which God is working in churches in Macedonia province. Fierce troubles came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very point, to the very limit. Those trials exposed their true colors. They were incredibly happy, though desperately poor. The pressure triggered something totally unexpected, an outpouring of pure and generous gifts I was there and I saw it for myself. They gave offerings of whatever they could, far more than they could afford. Pleading for the privilege of helping out in the relief of poor Christians. This was totally spontaneous, entirely their own idea, and it caught us completely off guard. What explains it was that. They had first given themselves unreservedly to God and then to us. The other giving simply followed out of the purposes of God 
working in their lives. That's what prompted us to ask Titus to bring the relief offering to your attention so that what was so well begun could be finished up. You do so well in so many things. You trust God, you are articulate, you are insightful, you are passionate, you love us. Now, do your best in this one too. What's this one too? In offering, helping the poor. I'm not trying to order you around against your will. But by bringing in the Macedonians enthusiasm as a stimulus to your love, I'm hoping to bring the best out of you. You are familiar with the generosity of our master Jesus Christ. So, so this is a template. It's a template for what? Generosity. Of our master Jesus Christ. Rich as he was, he gave it all away for us. In one stroke, he became poor and we became, right? Hey, somebody hear that? So here is what I think. The best you can, you can do right now is to finish what you started last year and not let those good intentions grow still. So these guys had a system that they put in place, a year-long system, something that was designed, a roadmap. They designed a roadmap for bringing relief to the poor. Right? That's exactly like what Boaz did to Ruth and changed their life. He says, your heart, your heart's been in the right place. Are you there with me? He says, your heart's been in the right place all along. You've got what it takes to finish it, so go to it. Once the commitment is clear, you do what you can, not what you can't. The heart regulates the hand. Let me say that again. The heart regulates the hand. So you will never be able to give except your heart is there first of all. Yes, except you first of all a culture. Except you first of all understand that the kingdom economy is a culture of gleaning. And I have responsibility under God to do it. That's why when you understand this, they never beg you to give an offering. Right? No, they don't. They do. Because once your heart actually understands it, your hand will do it. Right? <laughs> okay. So, the heart regulates the hands. This isn't so others can take it easy while you sweat it out. No. You are shoulder to shoulder with them all the way. Your surplus matches their deficit. And their surplus matches your deficit. In the end, you all come out even as it is written and he began to quote somewhere in the Old Testament the law of, of Moses when God filled you know God gave them manna said nobody under my commonwealth will, be, will, be, will lack for food and this is to let you know that I want everyone fed with the same diet and same quality so God gave them the manna and they picked manna every day guess what my friends were doing some felt we are not sure that this manna will subsist for the following day so let's pack for one month they pack for one month hide it in their cellar when they wake up the following morning it's gone into worms God said I tell you greed is not allowed in this kingdom so when they learned that lesson this is what they did they went and took what they needed for the day and they ate it. And the following morning, there was always provision. So at the end of the day, everyone had resource. Each of these things are principles that God continued to, all through scripture, to show the church in the last day about how to establish the culture of economy, of kingdom economy. So nothing left over. So now Paul began to say this, say, so as it was reading, Nothing left over to the one with the most. Nothing lacks to the one with the least. I thank God for giving Titus the same devoted concern for you that I have. It was most considerate of how we felt. But his eagerness to go to you and help out with this relief offering. Now the key 
phrase there is this relief offering. This relief offering. Don't forget I told you God's kingdom economy is for human redemption. God's wealth creation is for human redemption. It's never for self-aggrandizement. Right. So first of all, your heart has to be reconfigured. So he says this. I thank God for giving, said, giving him that. He said, but your eagerness to go to you and help out with this relief offering is his own idea. We are sending a companion with him. Someone very popular in the churches for his preaching of the message. But there is far more to him than popularity. He is rock solid trustworthy. So there is an issue of trust. I'll come and speak a little bit to these things. So he says, because of his trustworthiness and his life of integrity, the churches and picked him to go with us as we traveled about doing this work of sharing God's gift to honor God as well as we can taking every precaution against scandal so as we build the kingdom economy we must prevent it against scandal because there are some scandalous guys in the church whose assignment was clear feed the flock right but who will be had their own innovation and become oppressive and become self-indulgent and use the resource to enrich themselves right and go home and slap their wives right you know, men, some men go home in our churches and they go and they get drunk and go and slap their wife. How many people know you are here? Put your hands up. I know, you're here. I know I'll never see you do that. I know, I know you never accept, accept that. Everybody, everybody pretends they are nice in church. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. Until your wife comes to report to pastor. I hear what you. So, the atmosphere of the church listen to this must be void of scandal and toxicity so in verse 20 he says we don't want anyone suspecting us of taking one penny of this money for ourselves we are being care as careful in our reputation with the public as in our reputation with God that's why we are sending another trusted friend along he has proved his dependability many times over I'm going to talk a little bit about this because we have to have this regulation. Okay. It's probably dependability among ma many times and carries on as energetically as the day he started. He's heard much about you and he liked what he has heard. So much so that he can't wait to get there to see you guys. I added my own to see you guys. That's, that's not there. As you, as you can see. I don't need to say anything further about Titus. We have been close associates in this work of serving you for a long time. The brothers who travel with him are delegates from churches. A real credit to Christ. Show them what you are made of. The love I've been talking up in the churches, let them see for themselves. So Paul is actually saying, we boasted a lot about what you are, that you are a, you are a special a people with a, with a heart to help the saints, to help the poor. And so make it count. Now, the reason why this scripture and many like it begins to find relevance is because poverty was a big problem back in the early day church. There were certain, in fact, at different times, the hub of the church was Jerusalem and was impacted by high level farming. So the believers were struggling. So when I say, when you hear people say things like, confess, you know you're not confessing, you don't have faith, that's why you don't have money. Believe, you have no faith. The church in Jerusalem was hit by famine. The brethren loved the Lord and they were struggling to be able to have food. So these Gentile churches that Paul planted in Corinth, in Macedonia, in Achaia, in Philippi, right, were the ones sending resource to the church in Jerusalem. So that they don't starve to death. Let me tell you this, guys. Forget about what anybody has preached. 
we are all not going to have the same level of financial servants. And some of us who need to help some of us. And some of us need to help some of us. And if you have resource, no, you are God. You are that person that God has sent to help the other people. So when people ask you for resource, that's not the time for you to summonize. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Just help. Just be God's relief hand to, re- to relieve and to resource them. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I said I want us to read quite a bit more. 2 Corinthians 9, from 1 to 15. Did you enjoy that scripture reading? Yes, okay, should we read a bit more? Let's know what this culture is. Let's not do guesswork, right? 2 Corinthians 9. Paul took time to explain in chapter 8 the issue of generosity. Then in chapter 9, I think the issue of constructive collection of, of resources. So let's, let's, let's read verse 1. If I wrote any more on this relief offering for the poor Christians, what did he say? What did he call them? What did he call them? What did he call them now? The Christianity that you people in Lagos are running is Ophege like Christianity. You are in Lagos. Lagos the, was the initial capital of Nigeria. It's the hub of Nigeria's economy. The most money in this country is in this city. The farther you travel away from Lagos, the poorer you become as a Christian. I'll, let me say that again. All you Lagos Christians have no idea how poor your brethren are, are in the north. That's why the kind of messages that they preach in Lagos churches, I marvel. There is something called poor Christians. And they are not sinners. It's not because they don't have faith. It's just because they don't live in the center of excellence called Lagos. Where all the ships birth. Where all the major infrastructures exist. Because it used to be the capital city of Nigeria. The same thing about New York. The economy of America is in New York. It's not even in Washington, D.C. Let me tell you this. Because you need to understand the distribution of resources. The economic hub of America is not Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is the administrative hub. That's where the president sits. But where the real money is, is in New York. Where the most infrastructure is, is in New York. New York is the only place that you have taxes freely, that you have rail freely, that you have uh, red line, I mean blue line. Oh, tell you, tell you, blue line, red line, white line. You have your uh, troops that you cross over to Indianapolis. You will walk tire. Move to Arizona. You will sweat tire. Live in Indiana or somewhere. You don't have a car. You move nowhere. You are stuck. In every country, there are certain cities that is the economic hub. Nigeria is, Lagos is Nigeria's economic hub. That's why all of you ride SUVs and you call it faith. It's no faith. Let's move you to Satan Kaduna. Move you to Potiskum. Breeding Kebi. Eh? Zungeru. And come back and preach the same sermon you preached about lack of faith. So give me a break. Let's be real. You are so blessed that God planted you in this city. Wave your hands and say, Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> no faith it's not your faith it's not your prayer life it's not because you can quote scripture it's not because you can speak and confess make confession I hear people say I confess you, con- you what?
That's why you need to be careful as the church in Lagos and ask yourself the question, how are we resourcing the brethren beyond this place? So as the church, we have a coffer, we have a, we have a fund that we share, that we give every month to ministries who are not in Lagos. Every month. So every time you give an offering, know that that's what the money is doing, part of what the money is doing. Because this scripture is important, it's real. Right? And you need to see how they thank us when we send them those monies. I was, I was talking about someone that said, in the course of the week, a poor Christian reached out to me in this city. We used to walk together and he sent me that church. A friend, uh, there's nothing in the house. A family is suffering. Everybody said. Then I realized that there's something I wanted to buy. I just felt like, let me just chill and just enjoy myself and just buy myself something. I like gadgets. Just, just buy myself. And I look at the gadget I went to buy. Something, something small, something, something flips like that. I said to myself, I told them to buy it. I already sent them money to buy it. I said, don't stop me. Return the money to me. I can't. I don't have, I don't have my liver. I didn't know God was trying to save me, prepare me. So when that guy ca- calls, he said, so I, all I did was I just said, all right, no problem. Send me your account number. And I just gave him 50,000 euros. He called me. He prayed until his mouth hurts. The following morning, it was his call. Ah, you don't know what you did for me. You don't know what you did for me. That's when I realized there's a term called poor Christians. And that these poor Christians must be held by us. Right? So Paul said this, 2 Corinthians 9. He says, if I wrote any more of this leaf offering for the poor Christian, I'll be repeating myself. I know you are on board and ready to go. Are you ready to go? You are not yet. Don't worry, you'll be ready. Since I've been bragging about you all through Macedonia province, telling them Achaia province has been ready to go on this since last year. Your enthusiasm was now, by now, has spread to most of them. Now I'm sending the brothers to make sure you are ready, as I said you will be, so my bragging won't turn out to be just so much hot hair. If some Macedonians and I happen to drop in on you and found you unprepared, we'll all be pretty red-faced, you and us, for acting social of ourselves. So Paul is saying, there's an expectation that believers must know that they should make provision for brethren to glean from the blessing of God on your life. People should be able to glean from what? You are a blessed man. Stop complaining. You are blessed. You are really blessed. You are, you don't know where you live. You live in the center of Nigeria's money. You don't, you don't know how much they pay lawyers in Niger State. You don't want to know. A salary. And they are doing testimony in their church with 20,000 naira a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because 20,000 naira consistently in a month, that's a breakthrough. Don't worry. You, got, you legal negotiations don't know anything. You are spoiled. Now Paul says this. He says, so make sure that there will be no slip up. I have recruited these brothers as an advanced team to get you and your promised offering already before I get there. I want you to have all the time you need to make this offering in your own way. I don't want anyone, anything forced or hurried at the last minute. Remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. That's where, if you read it in NIV, it says, uh, you sow sparingly, real sparingly. My, my brothers have used that word, that scripture, <clears throat> to say, so a seed, real sparingly. You sow sparingly. It is not, there is something called pretext, post text, and context. Stop using the Bible to lie. Right? He was referring to your giving to helping the poor. You have to know that it's a seed you are sowing and God will cast to reap it. Now, what we do, 
when we give, now that's where the problem is. When we give, we give, we're thinking, oh, I drive a small SUV. I want to drive a bigger one. So let me give towards it. When I bought my car, with the other car I had, I went to speak in a meeting. And one undergraduate girl came to me and put something in my hand and said, I just want to sow into your life. It, it was a shock to me. This girl, probably under, under 200 level in the University of Lagos, and brought an offering because she saw my CLS 350 split car, Benz, and says, Wow, Mufi Toro. I want to so and I'm saying to myself, you have not even passed Torah level. You are you're already long throating to sow a seed into my hand. I can even buy you. You are now putting the little money that your paper give you as chop money to sow a seed into my life because you have heard someone say, so sparingly, reap sparingly. Uh, so what I heard it. My heart was very saddened how we how did we get the church to this level so she wasn't giving me because i had need she was using me as a pawn as a pawn and point of contact and leverage step your my anointing so she can leave frog she doesn't like me she's never met me she doesn't know my my agros but she sees my anointing as something to be manipulated to leapfrog her and that's what people who give to church do they don't love the Lord they don't love the preacher it's transactional I see your anointing your anointing can take me to the next level <laughs> pastor for me take one take if she doesn't see the money she will not believe me so let me <laughs> father Woman of God, please pray for me. Please, I I see go and succeed. And succeed. Can I have my money back, please? <laughs> that day, that thing broke me. What? God's gonna judge churches so, and judge preachers. Because now the people are not getting. Because you're lying to them. And so they are frustrated. They are changing churches. After they've up from one to four churches, they say to themselves, I'm not going to any church anymore. All churches are fake. All preachers are liars. You make them seven times more sons of hell. It was better if they never knew Jesus. Anybody home? Anybody here? Are you here with me? So what we have done is that we have built a culture of greed. Greedy believers, selfish believers who don't love Jesus, who don't love themselves, who just take advantage of one another. And this is what Paul was talking about. Let me bring this home quickly. This most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. He gives you something you can then give away. That's why God gives you. That you can do what? That you can do what? That's the culture of gleaning. That's the culture. You must give away. You must have a culture and say, I give something away. Right? He says, and this thing which you agree with me grows into full-formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. Carrying out this social relief work involves far more than helping meet the bare needs of poor Christians. It also produces abundant and bountiful thanksgiving to God. That's what your giving does. That's what your giving should be doing. Oh God, that you sent help to me. Lord, I thank you. He says, this relief offering is a prod to live at your very best, showing your gratitude to God. 
by being openly obedient to the plain meaning of the message of Christ. You show your gratitude through your generous offerings to your needy brothers and sisters and really toward everyone. Meanwhile, moved by the extravagance of God in your lives, they will respond by praying for you in passionate intercession for whatever you need. Because you have a need to. It's just that your need is not you don't have food in the house. But you have a need. That's why we say wealth is not just in money. It's in health. It's in relationship. It's in riches. It's in legacies. Many of you have different needs that is not financial. Right? You are good. Praise the name of Jesus. But you have health needs. You have relationship needs. Right? You have legacy needs. Is that correct? So this is what happens. When your generosity your economics, your financial administration and management and distribution of economic resources hits home as someone's meet point of need. Their own resource to you is as the race of intercession and raise of prayer for you. Most of what is covering this church is the prayer of those people that we give money to every month. I'm telling you that most of what is sustaining that because there is mutual exchange of resource there is distribution of economy across the church amen, amen. but while we distribute these resources there's a problem there are some factors that I see that destroy this economy and I, I'll deal with those things as quickly there are five of them number one the poor brethren must not have a sense of entitlement Number two, we must be careful to sniff out people who are blemishes at our love feast, who come to take advantage of our generosity to the brethren. And this is very important. This, this, these things I'm dealing with are very important. This is the balance that we need to have to it, right? Number three, there must be no wrong allocation of these resources or misappropriation of these resources by the leadership or oppression, or manipulation, or favoritism. You get it? It's always a problem when someone says, well, I go to that church, I have need, I told them about my need, they didn't do anything about it. But the other person that came after me, they took care of, this, of, that, of their need. It's always a problem. It happened in the Acts, Acts of Apostles too. Some people said, well, those of us who are, the, who are not the full-blooded Jews are not being taken care of. It's only the Greek, Grecian Jews that have been taken care of. Because in every place where you find human, there's always classism, ethnicism, and racism. It appeared also in Bible times. So we need to kill it. So for those of you who are managing resources, those of you in the wealth creation department, those of you in the, in the welfare department, you have the responsibility that, to know that you are oikonomos. You are what? Oikonomos. You are to give the people their food in the proper time. You must not be seen using the money for self or to, or to help your friends. There are people who use the resource of the church to befriend their friend, to see relationships. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm dealing with kingdom economy. So there must be no sense of entitlement. There are people who in the church who say, well, the pastor has preached and said, the poor you always have, the poor brethren in the church. So, they go to this person, they come to the church, they, take, they collect. They are calling people in the church. I, I hear it. And we are going to do something about it. Right? Because we have a system of resourcing in this church. We have a welfare unit. We have a wealth creation unit. Right? There is a system. In fact, they gave me a report that in the last one year, they gave about um, four people monies for different areas of business. Guess what happened? The report came back to me and said that they gave people money to 36% did not return the money. Now that's huge. When you are dealing with a non-for-profit and 36% of your capital, guess what? Guess what makes it worse? They ran away from the church. 
So we have people who are in the church just to scam the church, to take advantage of this kind of message. Let me say this. I'm the pastor of this church. I know how much this church has every month. You don't know what this church doesn't have. You see me looking like this. You think our church has all the millions in the account. We don't. We scrape the account to give to people who are in need. And the people take the money and elope. And that's when they say, Pastor, did something. Pastor, did something. When they don't want to pay, that's what they say. Did you see Pastor was talking about me? Pastor was preaching about me. That's when, when they don't have money and they need the loan, pastor is ready to happen to them. Pastor, pastor. <laughs> Go and take care of them. What is the need? Take care of it. He says, pastor, should we approve? I said, well, let's approve. Pastor, the money is too much. Let's approve. We approve. Payment time. Interest-free payment. Oh. What I say is interest-free so that we can have, so that we also can train you to be disciplined to be able to know how to be responsible financially. Boom. He takes the money and that says spreading rumor. Did you see what Pastor did? Did you hear how Pastor preached last week? It's me he's talking about. I have led their church for them. <laughs> Brother, leave our church, but please give the money back. The money back. <laughs> the loan with it. Nah, 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 nah. That is for that is my fringe benefit for, for, for attending your church for three months. No problem pastor says something or he did not say something you are upset with him we are sorry but well, please can we have <laughs> ah no 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 so we have we have loans that were not repaid that were never repaid and most times the people jump from this church and go to the other church I'm telling you they gave me he gave me the report I have the, I just I just said not to show you the the graphics so we must watch out to drive away the wolves in sheep's clothing we want to take advantage of this economist. We must build integrity in the fund borrowers. It's actually criminal for you to borrow and not pay back. The Bible says in Psalm 37 verse 22, only a borrower, a wicked man borrows and never pays back. So he equates you with a sinner that has not, that don't have a conversion experience. I know what happens to sinners. Yeah. You judge yourself. But people should stop it. It's killing the kingdom economy. It's destroying trust. It's breaking the heart of the pastors from giving, from providing resources. It's making us look stupid. Right? And you ask yourself, really, do I really want to do this? So by the time we begin to sound second guess, we miss out of people who really have real needs and we can't help them. And guess why? Because of you. Because of lack of integrity. And God will judge that. Finally, there's thoughtfulness in, in business. One of the things that destroys, and I told them this, I said, we decided to design a well creation plan. Because I don't believe that I believe that a church should have a system where you can resource your people because this is the principle. So I told them, I said, if you put anybody on a benevolence, we put them on a benevolence for between three and six months. After that, we take them out. We will, because of that, try to get you a job so that you can earn and then you can also be able to help other people. But guess what I found out? People don't want to work. They don't want to earn. They have every reason not to earn. And who really wants to earn when you can corner people in the church? Your church is not as rich as you think it is. With this man you are seeing, I'm a very great man. Praise the name. I know the way you look at me, I say, ha! If you see a pastor, hmm. if, you, if you pinch his skin, I don't know what that man uses to, to, to have his bath. Hmm? If you pinch him, I don't think his blood will come out. Probably, probably, probably his anointing. 
No, sir. <laughs> we are all walking in the same grace of the Lord. All right? The church is not, your church is not as rich as you think it is. So when they say, let's give an offering, don't look around and say, they don't need my money in this church. Look at their air conditioner. Look at the church. Look, look at the screen. Do you know about many of you are doing mathematics? Look at do you know this screen? How much this screen costs? In fact, many of you brag about our church. My church is a very rich church. Come. Praise the Lord. It's the grace we are chopping on. It's the giving of the saints. So this is what happens. When you refuse to give, you stop the flow to those who need to glean. When you stop giving, you're saying the poor might as well die. When you restrain yourself for whatever reason or forever for because of whatever experience you've had, and you say, I'm not gonna part with this money in my hand, what you are technically saying is, God, I'm not interested in the economy of your kingdom. So don't do it. Everybody must be given. Everybody must be helping the poor. Everybody must be resourcing the work. Pastor, but I don't have. You do have. You just don't see it. And let me tell you my experience, and I'll close with this. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I was about 20 years old. I gave my life to Jesus. I went to a meeting, and they raised an offering. An orphan, poor, broken, busted, had no money, no subvention, no one helped me. But I love Jesus. So I went to this meeting, and then they decided to raise an offering. And I said to my, my heart was said, said, I don't have any money. All I have in my pocket was one cobble. Now that one cobble was not the money for my meal that night. It was the money that was going to transport me back home to that church. The church was in Solary. I lived in Ibutimeta. The church was Christ Chapel. They were using this cinema in Solary along, along Akrele. Super Cinema. I was a member of their church. Somebody invited me. I went there and then they said they raised an offering for a need. And I, and I, as I was taking the money, I looked at my pocket. I looked and said, this money, nobody's going to take this one. One couple. I brought it out. Put it back inside again. I said, me and you, we are, we are, we are. But the Holy Ghost became so compelling and I said, Lord. So I dropped in the offering basket crying. So I dropped it. And I walked away home. Let me tell you this. No miracle will happen if you gave. You will walk home. Because what you are expecting me to say is, I took the money. I spoke to it. I said, Lord, the answer is by fire. The God who parted the Red Sea for Elijah and River Jordan for Moses. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> As I throw this one in this offering basket, Jackie or Rushi, Koshi, Koshi, took the money, last money, only money. Poor orphan Christian boy who loved Jesus too much, dropping in the offering, expecting. That by the time I step up, someone will say, How are you going my way? It never happened. Move first, they shah. <laughs> by the time, <laughs> hungry boy, orphaned, has only had one meal in the morning, it was Gary, and some sisters uh, made the mistake of going to a church. They preached a sermon on offering. He took the only one couple of them and put it in the offering and says, You know, as a young believer, I say, Somebody will just park beside me and carry me up. It, it didn't happen. When you give, nobody assures you that you have instant turnaround. But I guess here we are today. Fast track almost 40 years, serving Jesus, loving Jesus, preaching the same gospel. So it's about investment. Be invested in kingdom enterprise. Make up your mind to be an administrator of divine resources as a steward. And leave the rest to the Lord. For this morning, we thank you. And bless your name. Do you love Jesus?
speak to the Lord right now. Say, Father, connect my heart with my hands. Connect my heart with my hands. Put it in my heart so that I can put it in my own hands. The Corinthian church, Paul says, their overwhelming generosity in the midst of their overwhelming poverty. Yet they had joy. They had overwhelming joy in the midst of their overwhelming poverty and they had generosity. There is no excuse not to be a blessing to generations. Every time we send those monies to those people, every month without fail, they send scriptures, they send prayer, they send voicemails, say, Jesus, you don't know what you just did for us. You just saved us from embarrassment. That's what your monies are doing. That's what your givings are doing. So, Father, thank you for grace for the next level of generosity. Father, we particularly pray for grace for a generous heart. Give us a heart that gleans, a heart that is filled with a culture of gleaning and seeing the point of misery and helping them. Knowing that for our sake, you became poor so that through your riches, through your poverty, we can become rich. We thank you for the Spirit of Christ that testifies in our meeting today and forever. Amen. Receive strength. Receive strength. And by this we break every yoke of lack. Say the Lord God Almighty will cause resource to come to you so that you can resource the work of the Lord. So any hindrance in your work we break. Any curse over your family we break. Any power of darkness over your health we break. Any power of darkness over everything you do we break in the name of Jesus. And we release the blessings of the Christ covenant to be yours. In the name of Jesus. Come on, receive right now. Do you love Jesus? I said, do you love Jesus? Come on, put your hands together and celebrate him right now. Just one, just